Hello, welcome to our live stream uh, event. Um, this is doubling up as a podcast as well. So welcome to those that are potentially listening a little bit later via our podcast. Um, just a few quick introductions. Uh, first of all, we've got Caroline, who is our uh, CEO, so the uh, Barrod's chief executive. Uh, we've got Hannah, who is our young persons worker based in Comtaf and Bridgend. And then myself, Rob who is the campaigns and communications lead. Uh, so first of all, thank you to those that sent in your questions. Um, so we've got quite a few questions to get through. If you do have any questions um, as we are going along, just drop us a comment uh, and we will try and answer it. Um, and also apologies that we are running a little bit late. I won't say who, <laughs> um, but uh, no, we uh, hopefully it'd be absolutely fine. So as I said, we're just gonna literally just run through the questions. Uh, we'll try and answer them as best as possible. Um, and yeah, we'll just go from there. So the first question we have got asked is quite a big one actually. So why does the why does using terms like substance use instead of substance misuse or abuse matter? So Caroline, if we come to you first. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, and yes, it was me that was late. I do apologize, traffic in Cardiff. Um, it's a really good question. You know, it's, uh, I could spend probably the whole of the, um, the session talking about it. But I think what, what we need to understand is that language is important in anywhere in our lives. That's how we communicate. And it has so much meaning, so many different meanings. And what, what our language should be doing is putting people first. So if you look at something like you're a substance abuser, that has connotations that um, are derogatory at times can be something that is a, a negative thing that you're sort of in some ways uh, dysfunctional um, and I suppose what it does it makes those individuals feel a sense of shame sometimes a sense of that they can't you know um, they're a lesser person and it increases stigma and increasing stigma and creating stigma really prevents people coming and accessing services and making progress and making positive changes. So when we look at, so take the, you know, if you change from substance misuse to substance use, it describes what people are doing. It doesn't give a judgment. It doesn't give a judgment on them or what they are doing. And that then can, you know, again, take away some of the stigma, take away some of the shame. We've seen it in the papers, on the television, all these, you know, junkie or alky or these words that have really negative and unpleasant connotations and create a sense of isolation. If you think that people are going to think of you like that, are you going to come forward and say, I've got a problem, I need some help, I need some support. You're going to be worried about what your friends and your family think of you, what your communities see. And so I think that by by taking out those quite emotive and derogatory words out of the language that we use as professionals and we use about this this issue, I think creates a much much better way to engage people, to to reduce some of the shame and stigma, um, and isolation that individuals feel, so they can talk to people, they can access support, and uh, you know make positive changes. I think as well, like in terms of when you're talking about say misuse and abuse, it gives that perception that the use of the same, there's, there's different f forms of use of the same drug, which is That's isn't, right. isn't always the case, is it? No, no. And what, what's the cutoff point for misuse? Yeah, and you what's know, the if you use alcohol, when does your use of alcohol topple into misuse, topple yeah. into abuse? Um, you know, that, that there, is, there isn't anything, is it? And these are very judgmental from what we've seen. And, you know, uh, people who use, it's about education, isn't it? It's, you know, if people do use that or say misuse, and we say, oh, it's, it, we like to call it use. It's about the educating, how important language is important. You know, what, what we, we, every, everything we do is communicated through language, our tone, the words that we use, the words, what those words mean in certain, in certain relationships, in certain families, in certain organisation, and they they can become, become very very powerful. So we want it to be powerful, but in a positive way, in a way that um, you know reduces isolation, reduces stigma, 
and uh, uh, opens people up. You know, there's people who use drugs, people who use alcohol, you know, uh, I don't know, people who are violent, you know, it's putting that people first because we are, that makes us human. That We are all that, we are all that, we are all people. Cool, fab. And hopefully it'll start to influence people's perception of substances and people who use substances as well it can yeah you know and, and like you said it Absolutely. can influence in terms of maybe trying to reduce and minimize stigma yeah which is a huge thing yeah that, that's you know it's a it's a massive uh, nut to crack isn't it and uh, but it, all these things that we do to try it are incrementally move in that way look you know in barod we we had substance misuse we used substance misuse for a long time you know then you know an awareness was created and we're like actually yeah that that isn't the way that we should we should refer to people or refer to people's actions and so we educated ourselves and now we're very much about educating our other professionals so that people do use this de destigmatizing language um, and I think if that is a sort of almost like a movement people understand that I think that that will have an impact Brilliant. Thank you, Caroline. Hannah, this one is for yourself, um, as you are a young person's worker. And you're a young person. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, I'm under 25, so technically. Don't rub it in. <laughs> um, so how do you talk, and this is very topical, so how do you talk to a young person about their vaping? So it's tricky because within Barrowd, a lot, I think if... It's either a lot of or all of the barrel services aren't directly commissioned to cover vaping. So in Kumtaf Morganug, we're not commissioned to cover vaping. Um, so if somebody was to come in with a vaping issue, we would have to signpost directly to nicotine cessation. We couldn't just tackle that. But I think um, there's a demand kind of coming in with schools asking for those talks, particularly in, in some areas. Um, and, and some services have set up kind of uh, nicotine and vaping workshops that are quite direct. Some people will do that direct work and try and find ways to implement that. Um, and then others will, you know, for, for my service, for example, we try and incorporate it into our existing school talks. So um, we kind of do that section where we say, you know, what name some name some legal drugs. Then what are the big three kind of legal drugs that we would be using recreationally? And you know, we come onto the subject of nicotine, and then we 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 get onto that subject through you know to vapes through there. And I think um, the important thing then, as well as when I'm doing my assessments, when I'm doing one to one work with people. Um, it's really important not to talk about uh, it's really important to talk about um, n any nicotine or caffeine intake so whenever we're doing that assessment we'll cover the kind of drugs that they'll think of more obviously and I'll always make sure I'm asking about any kind of vaping or caffeine intake because I suppose it, it comes into play it's almost that loophole there of being able to cover it because while we're not directly commissioned to be kind of working along vaping if somebody is using a substance and they're vaping or they're having caffeine that's technically polydrug use that's going to have an interaction you know you might have somebody coming in saying that they're they're smoking cannabis to help them sleep and then they say they're having five monsters a day well we need to talk about your caffeine intake and it's, it's very similar with the vaping then so I think um, my two kind of ways that I speak to young people about it are the first one's quite interesting because it shows a lot of self-awareness I often say right I'm 24 they the vaping companies say that they're marketing to my age group, the 18 to 25 year olds. Do you agree? And this morning, I did this morning actually to a group of year nine. So that's 13, 14. And everybody said no. And I said, who are they marketing to? And they said us. Um, so they're very aware of that. They're very aware that they're being marketed to. And then I think the other thing is to say to people, okay, 600 puff, typical kind of vape bar. Um, what would you kind of say is the equivalent amount of cigarettes and that getting to guess and the stat we work with is about 46 cigarettes and you get people saying like oh five ten and then you're working up to that mark and they all sort of feel the shock of oh my god right how many are you going through in a day oh gosh like I'm going through one every two days or and it's that realization of okay you're smoking 20 a day um so I guess it's like I wouldn't normally go for shock factor with people but I think when it goes to vaping it's you know the messaging is so unclear around it and I think that tends to just raise enough awareness of maybe I need to be doing something around this so um, I think the difficulty with vaping is because it's so normalized and there's almost a status that comes with it with young people in, in the schools at the moment it's a really tricky one to 
to kind of touch on and um in our kind of young persons group where all the young person services come together it's one that's coming up every single time we meet how are we going to implement these kind of vaping topics into our talks without you know kind of going too far into them that we're doing what we're not commissioned to do um but I think at the moment it's just really important to get the information out there that isn't out there because I think they're so uh trivialized at the moment so I suppose the the first kind of line we have is to raise awareness of actually how much nicotine are is is in these vapes how much they're putting into their bodies and that's kind of the way we're going at the moment and that's what I do myself at the moment um and always kind of making people aware of those nicotine cessation clinics it's really hard to do any direct work with them because we're not technically commissioned to do it but it is just I think it's just that raising awareness of you know letting young people know what what they're putting in their body um but those resources are kind of growing at the moment we've got a few people who are really keen on on building those resources and those workshops so they're kind of coming into place and they just need some fine-tuning but yeah so that's hopefully going to be up and coming and yeah watch the space I was going to say, in terms of with with regards to vapes, they obviously first came on the scene, didn't they? In terms of as a harm reduction measure for cigarettes, yeah, as yeah, a, as a public health measure. So, as as that made it a little bit tricky, that potentially you got viewpoints that these are I'm not necessarily saying this is the terminology, but a, a safe alternative to to our um, cigarettes. So therefore, that the risks are, are pretty minimal. Yeah, I think a lot of young people don't recognise. Um, I want to say young people in this kind of vein. I, I'm I'm talking below eighteen, so like people in school, um, not under twenty fives. So I think they don't realise that nicotine carries harms. I think there's the message that cigarettes are harmful, vapes are not. So I think that it's educating then around the you know always educating around the harms around nicotine, um, and actually the fact that it is a dependence forming drug that young people don't tend to recognize and how fast that addiction can form um and what that withdrawal looks like um but yeah just kind of that messaging around this this was designed to get people to stop smoking you know i guess vapes vapes were created weren't they in the hope that you'd start vaping reduce and reduce and reduce and then eventually stop vaping it was almost like a titration um and then just yes sort of speaking to young people about how they've never smoked and they've just started doing this because obviously it's trendy um and you know it is all over tiktok like different tricks that you can do um and yeah just kind of getting that messaging out there that this was never supposed to be completely safe it never it was always recognized that nicotine is a harmful substance but it was just less harmful than than smoking so yeah just getting those messages out there Cool, thank you. Caroline, anything you want to add about vaping? That was very educational, <laughs> Hannah. I mean, it's right, isn't it? You know, you, you create a public health intervention to reduce smoking-related harm and death, and you have this very sort of like negative unintended consequence that has been exploited by marketing. And, and again, we're not, well, not here to judge, but we're here to educate. And, you know, and it seems that we're doing a really good good job of that and learning on the job so to speak really and you know the evidence is emerging as we go through but you're not only dealing with vapes but you're dealing with sort of like you know illicit vapes as well you know that aren't so you don't actually know what the harms are in there and and I guess what we're about is educating about harm and if you don't know and you can't give those harms so you know it's uh, it's a problem that we've all got to grapple with who work with young people and we seem to be doing a good job Hannah brilliant cool okay so the next question so do harm reduction practices for example needle exchangers crack pipes encourage drug use in our communities so i guess it's open to both of you on that one no end of <laughs> no it doesn't i mean well you know there's uh, i guess it may you know make it more obvious but does it actually increase is somebody going to go oh, I can get a needle, I think I'm going to start using drugs now. Or I can get a pipe, a crack pipe, or I think I'm going to go and buy some crack and start using it. You know, that just doesn't happen. Um, but it's a very, it's an emotive way of creating fear in, in our communities. Um, people are using drugs. People will use drugs for, 
for, for, for, for eternity. It's about us making sure that we have the best way in which we can help prevent and minimise harm to those individuals. And tools and interventions like needle exchange, uh, crack pipes are fantastic ways of doing that. They're also fantastic ways of engaging with people. And there's, as far as I'm aware, no empirical evidence that that starts people using drugs. So, yeah, no. I was going to say the exact same thing. My mind went to, you know, I don't think anybody that's never injected would suddenly go, I'm going to go inject because <laughs> I can get a needle. You know, I just don't think that happens. Um, I think um, people are uncomfortable with, with the visibility. I think as society, we like to kind of have a bit of a higher than thou attitude sometimes. Or, you know, we don't want to kind of see these things that we don't, kind of subscribe to um so i think people can be uncomfortable with the visibility of needle exchanges but i would argue that they're not visible most people don't know this building exists and we have a needle exchange here most people who do know exists have no idea that we have a needle exchange um i think it's a very private thing um most people don't realize that you can get needles from a chemist um i think they're still quite um quite private spaces so i think yeah i think it's it's moral panic it's yeah. that um you know something that people want to capitalize on to, to to spread those kind of negative messages and the stigma but i i would say that the pattern tends to be you know especially with with kind of drugs like that in, involve snorting or smoking equipment um i think the messaging around needles is very very clear be because of you know like hiv and things like that the messaging there is very clear i don't think i've ever met um, an injector at this point who has ever intentionally shared equipment that they're very clued up on that information I think it's more the snorting and the smoking that is the risk at the moment and we don't have that equipment apart from foil um, in exchange um, which is I guess the important of, importance of the, the discussion around crack pipes um, but I think ultimately what you're seeing is people who engage in potentially risky practice being unaware of these things and then knowing about them and, and coming in. You don't tend to see outside of injecting people sort of being aware of a needle exchange and then saying, I'm going to start using substances because of that. It just doesn't happen. And again, I guess in terms of with needle exchanges back in the 80s, they were another public health measure, weren't they? Yeah. So obviously it was in response to growing trends of blood-borne viruses. and HIV, Yeah, and I know in terms of evidence from Eastern Europe where they've actually significantly reduced their needle exchange provisions in those countries that the rates of blood bomb virus among people who inject drugs has significantly increased um, due to them yeah, scaling back on their harm reduction measures there as well. And obviously in terms of crack pipes currently they're not under the exemption list within the Misuse of Drugs Act yeah. so uh, at present we're not able to, to give them out via via the needle exchanges as well. Cool. Caroline, I think this probably, this next one sits with yourself. Uh, again, another biggie. So where does Barrod stand on decriminalizing all drugs? I was asked this very recently as well. I can't quite remember where I was asked it, um, about uh, our view on that. So my view is actually very clear. You're you're criminalizing people who are using drugs. You're creating this huge the war on drugs is this huge thing which has been created because you've pro prohibited certain substances. You've chosen what those substances in, in some way because of their harms or their risk of becoming dependent. Yet we've got the biggest legal drug, alcohol, which is available wherever you want whenever you want it. Obviously, there's age limits on that. But to, to criminalise all the other drugs misses, I think, an opportunity um, to, again, put people first, look at this as a societal problem, as a medical problem, as a health problem, and creates um, a huge another layer of not just dealing with people who use drugs as criminals, but the whole machinery behind drugs and their import and their selling and, you know, and the amounts of money and, uh, and, and blood and violence that goes with that, 
you know, it's an opportunity, I believe, to think totally differently about how we look at drugs. And, you know, there are plenty of um, plenty of examples across the world who have taken that leap. And, you know, the world hasn't stopped moving in its, on its axis. You know, it hasn't created some horrific kind of everybody has started taking drugs and, you know, some ridiculous uh, civil unrest about that. It's actually very pragmatic and, it, and it's evidence for it, for it to work. But I think with drugs, it's such an emotional and fear and moral panic, as you said, Hannah. You know, we can't get past this, seemingly can't get past this. And that's because of all the information that we've been fed through through media, through um, governments, through, you know, you know, even literature, writing, you know, around the dangers. Um, and I think we just need to have big, grown-up, pragmatic conversations around drugs and their, crim and, you know, their criminal status, for a better phrase. So, for example, you know, cannabis, which has been legalised in various stages, you know, various levels across states in America, and now in Germany, and some for recreational use. And again, n n n you know, rights haven't broken out at all. But if you look at that, it wasn't really, a, in, in terms of, in some of those ways, it was around a, a, a market opportunity. It was like neoliberalism at its absolute, wow, there is a new market here. If we, you know... It's not for like, oh, let's do this because it's the right thing. So you've got almost the markets driving the policy around the criminalization of drugs in certain in certain areas in certain states. So we've just got to have a proper grown up conversation about it. Um, so yes, I would I would say, you know, decriminalizing drugs is wrong. Okay, doc. Direct enough. <laughs> Anna, is there anything you want to add around the, the, the whole model of decriminalisation? Yeah, I'd say, like, you know, if we're asking, like, Barrod's stance on it, like, I wouldn't say Barrod's saying, like, yeah, free for all, let's all legalise it. And I think that's the message around decriminalising, isn't it? Is people think that suddenly we're saying it's a free for all and, you know, let's all just constantly go out and do everything. And that's not what people are talking about when we're talking about decriminalisation. And I think... It's more that I think Barrow as an organisation like follow evidence and science, right? It's like, you know, like we've, the science is increasingly showing that actually certain drugs that are carrying certain stigmas might have massive potential in science and therapy that, you know, certain policies all over the world are managing the the issues around substance use a lot better than criminalizing drugs is um so i suppose it's about trying to introduce the most or, and support like the most effective treatment systems um and i think as well it's um something i always i always pull to and and try and raise at any point i can is the fact that obviously a lot of our drug laws follow a lot of american drug laws and i think it was during the nixon administration they it's, it's been found now to have been said that they knew what they were doing when they decriminalized a lot of drugs. They decri when they criminalized a lot of drugs, they criminalized drugs to do with racism. Yeah. You know, they, 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 like mar marijuana, named marijuana to be associated with a certain group of people instead of calling it cannabis. So, you know, they, it, it, you have all the issues around the crack cocaine having higher penalties than cocaine because white people used cocaine. You know, so I think it's a lot of people don't realise that so many of our laws in 2024 around drugs are rooted in racism and around kind of trying to control society around racism. So um, they're just outdated. They're really outdated. And when we know as an organisation that other countries are managing substance use so much better, we really need to be kind of lobbying to follow suit. So, yeah. Yeah, lots of examples, like you said, Caroline, across the world. Po Portugal is probably the, the most yeah. well-known one, you know, and you've got the likes of Czech Republic as well as, as many other kind of countries. But, um, yeah, there's a really good paper that was released probably about a month or so ago by Neve Eastwood, Alex Stevens and Kirsty Douse, who put forward a modest proposal of um, decriminalisation of possession of drugs in the UK. So, um, shameless plug check out our podcast with Neve um, as well I think it's one of the latest ones uh, as well okay she's great yeah she's fab 
so how do we help people to realize slash understand the impact alcohol has on us and our communities? I suppose we do we do that all the time. That that's part of what we do um, at Barrod. That's part of what our services are. But it's about education. It's about you know I, I liked what you said, Hannah, about science and evidence. And yes, there are lots of evidence of alcohol harms. Um, what they do to you as an individual and how you can manage those harms and how you can minimize those harms. What they do to families. Uh, and what alcohol can sometimes do to our communities. And I think you just, again, it's about being clear about those things, using the science, explaining what it is and how you can manage that. And there's lots of examples for doing that. But but I think, I th I think for me, it's... <laughs> you've got this kind of uh, alcohol paradox, they call it, you know, when you, you know, you know, you can't look at alcohol or its harms or how its use affects people or individuals without looking at the other factors like poverty and deprivation. And all those have such a, you know, when it comes together with alcohol, you seem to have a disproportionately more harm on those individuals than those who are from less deprived um, uh, areas. And that seems to me to be such a cruel, and there's many cruel things in our society, isn't it? It's been such a cruel thing. So it, it, it is about just educating individuals. It is about sharing the latest advice. It's about having conversations. It's about looking at ways that you can manage your own intake, that you can share that with your families. You can look at, you know, what we do in schools right from as, as early as we can. And, you know, there's evidence to, to suggest that alcohol use is, is dropping with young people. Um, you know, we as a as Britain, you know, <laughs> we've got a we got a really big culture around drinking about you know it's friday today you know lots of people will be going like well, what am i going to do on friday night and the know? sun's out and the sun's out you know so we'll be going like well have a have a glass of water with every drink <laughs> but you know but there is so you know there we do live in a society where not just alcohol is is normalized but it's encouraged and it's celebrated and it's often part of the focus of how we enjoy our, our in our communities and so how do you you know acknowledge that yet help people to manage their use i guess um and that's education awareness raising um you know in all those various forms i think like you said you know it's it's very much part of our society and we've me and Hannah have discussed it before in terms of it was a previous budget. I'll try and say his name properly, Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> um, you you know, could but, say the other one. I none of us disagree. <laughs> but um, but you know, part of his budget was specifically around alcohol, and he kind of explained, you know, the great British institution of the pub. Yeah. You know, and you, could you imagine that being talked about in terms of facilities for the yes. use of other substances? Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah. So. It is, you know, it's, but I think what, what we are now seeing within a society, like you, you said there in terms of reduction of alcohol use among young people, but we are starting to see a little bit of a shift in terms of alcohol consumption, I, I would say, in that, you know, more people now are maybe not choosing to drink or they're turning to like alcohol free kind of um, right, Rob. drinks, you know, from a wider society yeah. perspective. And I know talking with colleagues that, that you know, and again, predominantly young people, that they are, you know, not necessarily turning to alcohol in, in any shape or form, really. Yeah. So I think, may, I, I would say we're kind of, the, the messaging is getting out there in terms of you I, know, I, potential harms yeah. associated to alcohol. I, I think you're right, Rob. And, and, and I think that, you know, if you went into a pub five years ago, you know, and, and asked for an alcohol-free drink, they maybe have caliber or something, you know, something not tasted yet. Yet now you have an array of alcohol-free drinks and, and options, and and it's you know and it, it, it is fine. It's not cons you know it's not like oh my god I can't believe you you're not drinking, you know what on a Friday night and it's sunny and you're not having a drink, 
you know, there, there is much less of that, I would say, and there's more options. And, and also, I w there's, a, there's another thing that I just thought about, and it's about healthy living, you know, um, wanting to be fit, yeah. wanting to, you know, um, yeah, you know, clean living, having a healthy diet, uh, having, you know, low alcohol intake. You know, there are, there is, there is, I would say there's much more of that I certainly see. And it's interesting, we were involved in Drinkwise HOL, which is about older adults drinking and about how you educate older, you know, older adults because, again, alcohol will start to have sometimes a more, more impact on them as, as people age. And then how do you message that without, you know, scaremongering around that and about the evidence of what those messages work and the triggers and where you might, you're, you may be, you know, happy with your drinking your drinking isn't causing any harms and then something may happen in your life you know retirement or empty nest or something like that and your drinking will slowly increase you know how you get those messages that people can manage their own and recognize what they're doing is oh i'm drinking a bit too much got to have alcohol free days you know i'm not so sure about the units whether anybody listens to them but again they are another way of looking at you know what's harmful and what's not i guess Brilliant. So sticking with alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, do you think Wales should follow Scotland's laws and restrict the times we sell alcohol? So I'm, I'm not uh, sure of the evidence on that. I mean, my instinct would be to say no. Um, you know, you know, I suppose when we look at when we're harm reduction, we're looking at less prohibition you know, helping people make right choices, helping people, you know, yes, have that empowering them to make the right choices of what they put into their bodies, whatever that is. So I think that, you know, years ago, years ago, pubs were, let's show my age now, pubs would open from 12 and think until 2.30, then they'd be closed, and they wouldn't open then until 7, and then they'd close at 11, and then at 10.30 on a Sunday. I mean, did people drink less then? I mean, I don't know. Um, but there was a reason and a rationale for to have much more open um, licenses or where you can sell alcohol. Um, you know, you have this, you know, cafe society where you can have a drink whenever. You look in the continent in Europe, people are able to, you know, and they don't seem to have the huge sort of like lager culture that we have. Um, so, you know... I, I, I'm not sure of what the evidence would be that that would stop people, you know, having a huge, you know, well, minimise the effect of alcohol. I guess maybe there's a potential, I'm, I'm looking at it from a very sceptical perspective, but there's the potential that if you are restricted on the amount and the times that you're able to buy it, maybe you're more likely to bulk buy and maybe then in terms of consume more than you intend to i don't know well that's just yeah, my... i know i i think i don't know well but i think you may well have a point but i guess you know there is something around you know i think the first time i went into a service station and there was a lot of alcohol there i was like wow that that's that's interesting but you know well why shouldn't there be you know there's cigarettes there and you know um, and you know that you can, you know, now you can deliver, you know, you can, you know, there is, you can access whatever you want. You can deliver cigarettes, you can deliver alcohol. Is that having a, de a detrimental impact on society? I don't know whether it is yet, you know, that access to it whenever, however. So it would be good to watch to see what, how that works. Yeah, in absolutely. Scotland. But yeah, in terms of from COVID then, the big C word, uh, has there been any change in the substances people use since COVID? So, um, Hannah, firstly, young people, is there some anything that you've noticed? So, I mean, in terms of things that I've noticed, um, so I started working in this field like post-COVID, so I wasn't in the field pre-COVID, um, but... I pulled up some stuff, um, I was looking at the mix and some of the data they've put through. So interestingly with young people, so under, under 25s, they've seen a decline in alcohol use and an increase significantly in, I think vaping has trebled. So, um, so the reports of people who've said that they have vaped 
um, in the past like 12 month window actually like tripled um alcohol went down um but the amount of people reporting to use um any drugs class a b or c has increased um so i think um yeah i think the people 17 percent young people using class a drugs um which is much higher than the 11 percent in 2021 so i'm guessing there we're talking about things like cocaine um that's increasing um and then 33 percent um of using a legal drug um in uh, after covid and that was 22 percent pre-covid so that's quite a big step up um i don't know why so a lot of the people that i'm working with where they've reported that their substance use has gone up that went up during covid they said it was a lot of being bored um for me i saw a lot of people drinking a lot during lockdown so i find it very interesting that the substance use has gone up and the alcohol has gone down um but I don't know if maybe that's because during COVID, maybe the alcohol went up, went up, and then when people were free to go out, you had a lot more people going to festivals and things. Um, so maybe that's played a role. Um, I also don't know if it has got a correlation with that kind of, um, kind of increase in fitness and that. I think that there's a lot of messaging around alcohol being harmful, and a lot of messaging around the potential. Um, use of various substances in medicine and therapy and I think some people are making a conclusion from that that alcohol is dangerous and some drugs are safer which is obviously not correct um so I think that we're seeing and especially from working with my young people that's a lot of the messaging that they're getting we're having to kind of unpick that and why they think that but yeah so the data sit showing that with under 25s that since kind of lockdown has stopped the alcohol has decreased and the the substance use has increased particularly class a drugs like cocaine so yeah and i'd say that's probably echoed in what i'm seeing yeah we certainly saw alcohol increase and we saw people who were managing the alcohol pre-covid you know as, uh, in a way i guess losing control of that managing it you know if you think about it it was an incredible it was like a shock a society shock you know, people were very isolated and uh, in difficult situations. And I guess one thing that they could get was was alcohol. And then I guess when we came out of it, it you know, and you can see that in alcohol-related death, um, the increase in alcohol-related death. And so we did see that. I think we broadly saw an increase in most things. Um, we saw drop it drops in people being referred in and then it increasing then post-COVID. Um, again, in terms of what's in the market in, in, in a drug sense will be, you know, what's available. Um, we see an increase in, in cocaine. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, and, and I guess what we do, what we did see certainly very quickly post the pandemic was an increase in people's phys deterioration, in their physical, mental health and their ability to sort of manage any kind of substance use that they had. Um, and I think that it's got a long tail, you know, it will continue. And I think particularly, Hannah, with young people, you know, having, you know, two teenagers who are in um, lockdown themselves and knowing their friends, you know, it has an impact on, on them. Now, whether that relates to some, you know, increase in substance use or, or changes, um, is yet to be seen, but yeah, I, I I don't think the effects of the pandemic are going to be going away soon. No, and you mentioned alcohol-related deaths, so yeah, the latest stats came out, and they a week or so ago, and they're, they're the highest on record. They are alongside the highest on record for drug-related deaths. Exactly, for the England and Wales. And yeah. Okay, so we got three more. Um, so. The next one is a little bit similar to the decriminalization one, but on the flip side. So does criminalizing drugs work to reduce use? So um, I think I was sort of mentioned earlier on that, you know, if alcohol was illegal, you know, would all the people who are using alcohol now use alcohol? Well, probably not. There are people who won't do anything because 
it's illegal or it's against the law of you know but that's their values and that's they wouldn't do it um so if you take that pure argue that pure thing then then yes but the flip side of it is when you prohibit something with everything that comes with it that that in and of itself creates more potential for harm um you know because because people will use it and people will and also if they feel that the laws don't really reflect what they're seeing people find that law then if you don't respect a law then you know why is that law um so so i suppose my answer is yes and no really yes in the strictest sense of the word you know people who will not commit a crime or do anything against the law wouldn't um but you know the harms would be you know uh, you know notwithstanding that the harms of criminalizing drugs and any drugs would be um are too great i think yeah there was a well-known home office report 10 years ago now in 2014 that and it's quite ironic there's a home office report yeah that said tougher drug laws do not have any effect on levels of drug use no well there you go so. you know it, you know drugs drugs are, are illegal or you know d- illicit drugs not all drugs are illegal are they you know there's loads of them you get prescribed and, and all that kind of stuff but yeah if you've got to use them it doesn't really matter you know you're going to go oh that's a class a i'm i'm going to look for class b or you know that kind yeah. of thing i don't think you know there's no and i don't think most people when if they consider taking a substance they don't necessarily consider the legality they consider no. the potential harm yeah. more so most you know most people don't yes. take heroin because of the potential risks and yes. harm, not necessarily because it's illegal but it's quite funny you say you know if a if a law is not necessarily fit for purpose then who respects that and and i always think you know magic mushrooms are a class a drug <laughs> you know which i find you know absolutely absurd i mean it, it is it's it's yeah if, if a law is like you know what you know you can't you can't tr- you know you've got no respect for that um and you know and you see think you know well the harms well i think this is much more harmful than that you know somebody's i don't know using hallucinogenics or using whatever and they go well it's, at least it doesn't you know send me into a state of those people you know pissed out their mind sort of thing um yeah so you know it, it's there should be evidence and as we know our laws aren't necessarily based on evidence they're based on fear Absolutely. Okay, last two. Uh, what stops people from accessing services? What are the barriers? You almost come full circle now in a way, isn't it? Because the first question you asked was around substance use and, uh, and misuse and the language. And when we talked about that, we talked about stigma. So I think that it starts with the individual. If they re- recognise that they have a problem or they need some support, where do they go to? Do they do they feel that there is an openness within their families or, the, or their loved ones or their people close to them or in their schools or in their in their work potentially that that would be they would have a compassionate response to sharing their issues um, and by trying at all times to destigmatize will allow more of that to happen. So there's that, and then and then I guess when you you recognise that you want some help. Do you know where to go for it? Would you go to your GP? Would your GP be compassionate? And your GP say, well, you can go to Barrod or wh- whoever, you know, to being open about those pathways into service. And then when people look at services like, like Barrod, they go, oh, I don't want to go, I don't want to go in there, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen to me, you know, am I going to be greeted so then it's for us for that moment when that person either comes on the live web chat picks up a phone to us sends in an email or walks through our door to make them feel as welcome as we possibly can that they're in the right place that we're not going to judge them and that we're going to really work with them for their with them as an individual and work with them to support whatever they want to do um so so I think that's why people don't, they either feel ashamed, they don't feel it's for them, and they go, well, Barrett, is that just for drugs or what's alcohol? And the GP perhaps not knowing. <coughs> but I, I think that 
we try to be um, as as you know uh, share with our professional um, partners as much as possible because a lot of that is um, is our referral route. But then also the people who use our services are our greatest ambassador. So if they can go and have well, I had a positive experience. You know, don't worry about it. They're really nice people. They really work with you. They'll help you. Then you're much more likely to come along and, and into our service. But I think ultimately, you know, stigma plays a huge stigma, shame, and isolation play a huge role in people not getting the support that is here and that they need and that we would love to provide. I think it's just knowing that we're here, just awareness of us. I think the more um, we kind of push outreach the better you know we've always had young persons outreach workers and you know like we're in schools and youth clubs but now that we've got more of an adult outreach outreach team in in come taff it's great um kind of connecting more with um other services in the area getting the message out there and again you know putting faces to the organization you know we've got our own workers getting out and about letting people know that we are here so you're not just turning and talk to strangers then you know so I think that's really really important just having that presence in communities for, from us as well yeah we have peers as well don't we that go out and obviously oh, yeah, engage of course, with peer-to-peer -peer and locks are great as well that type of thing yeah but in all aspects of kind of delivery of services yeah. you know the use of, of peers I think that they say you know they have privileged access to yeah. maybe individuals that may not access traditional treatment services yeah rob i was at the um peer-to-peer -peer, or where's peer-to-peer um event um in cardiff yesterday and you know you know again you you write you know about peers uh, can access can go to places where not that we wouldn't be welcome but okay, we wouldn't know where, where they were or you know the people would be concerned about what was happening but those peers can really reach um reach many many people and uh, and also our greatest ambassadors. Um, yeah, it was very inspiring yesterday. And I think one, one piece of work that we're doing a lot of now as well is around ensuring our services are trauma-informed because I think that definitely, you know, historically has acted as a barrier. And, you know, in terms of talking about potential specific genders, you know, that's potentially more of a barrier towards um, females. Or, or people who identify as females, you know, because yeah. potentially they're, yeah. they have experienced trauma more than their male counterparts. So therefore, you know, yeah. and, and, and services, I guess, traditionally, again, like many things in society have kind of been geared towards males, you know. So, Absolutely, Rob. So I think, yeah, trauma-informed approach, yeah. you know, is, is quite pivotal moving forward. Yeah, it, it, you're right. And, you know, we still, we you know, 50-50 population of you know, male to female, and we still, we get, you know, regularly, you know, 60 to 65% male and, and the rest female. So, you know, particular, yeah, groups in our society seem to have more difficulty accessing or are more worried about accessing our services. And we need to ensure that we are accessible as possible um, and make sure that our environments are trauma informed, that they're really welcoming, warm and people feel safe in them, and that the way we speak to people is trauma-informed, and the way that we do everything, really. Even our staff policies, we're working on them being trauma-informed. Again, that's all about language also, and about, you know, uh, creating warm environments. You know, if you go into somewhere that feels, feels too clinical, you feel you're in a doctor and you're going to be told off for doing something bad to your body. You know, that's not great, is it? You want to somebody to understand and have some c compassion and some empathy and listen to your story um you know because every story is unique and everybody has their own situation and that should be valued and cared about and not seen as just another patient or somebody coming in they're that person when you say about um, being presented with a clinical environment, it takes me back to when we visited Barcelona. Oh, I agree. One of the consumption rooms that. there and everyone was in white coats. And you could just imagine people turning up, you know, to, to access that facility and just got a bunch it, of professionals all in white coats, you know. It, <laughs> it was like a scene from One Flower of the Cuckoo's Nest, really. It was, it was, you know, what I felt nervous in there. I felt traumatised yeah. after that. <laughs> I mean, suffice to say, we did go to a, a couple of other injecting spaces, which are very different from that. But 
and to counter why they did that because they wanted all these injecting spaces to be in different environments and one was in that hospital but yeah white coats and no no yeah so last one then so hannah if we come to you first so what would you like to see change in the future uh, I think one of the big ones is around the vaping. I think we, as especially as young persons workers, would like a lot more scope around what we can work on around vaping. You know, obviously you mentioned um, kind of um, unregulated vapes and things like that. That's sort of the way that we work at the moment is our little loophole. Uh, because there's a massive risk at the moment with, you know, kind of... Um, adulteration and synthetics being present in unregulated vapes and just raising awareness around that is, is a lot of the stuff that we do so it'd be really nice to have more scope around that which I think you know discussions are taking place um I think more of what we're doing as well around kind of inclusion and we've got a lovely pride banner by here kind of the presence in pride that we're having this year in Swansea and Cardiff so I think more of those kind of things you know around you spoke about educating ourselves we're doing a lot of kind of education within Boward, lots of kind of training around kind of LGBTQ uh, inclusion, trans inclusion, like we have our language corner, terminology corner every week where we sort of speak to ourselves about the language we should be using. So I think more of that just around making sure that we're always being um, or trying to be as informed and educated and, and kind and compassionate as we can be and inclusive as we can be. Um, but I think, yeah, vaping is a really big one around the um, that and, and communication like we've seen it in, in the yp group so where all the services come together it's great because we're all just sharing all our resources nobody's gatekeeping now so it's we've got a lot more time on our hands now because we're just sharing resources we just got to rebrand things to make sure they're fit for what we want to do um so that's great because we can spend more time planning and actually speaking to people um rather than trying to get resources together and try and find stuff so that's great and i think if that could be mirrored throughout barrowed across all adult services and everything as well that'd be great um because it's proven to work really well for for the young people services so yeah that's all i can think of brilliant caroline for yourself good to know hannah good to know <laughs> uh yeah i mean i think that you know we need to in wales think big in terms of our innovation in terms of how we want to see services in the future fit for purpose and we talked a little bit about you know we want to see the use of and the distribution of crack pipes and uh, inhalation devices. We want to see drug checking, front of house drug checking everywhere. You know, we've been trying in Swansea for quite some time, but we're, you know, we've got this big barrier of a home office license. We'd like to see Welsh Government and we'd like to see governments come together to, to provide these really simple but really effective front of house drug checking. We've got, you know, the threat of uh, nitazines and other synthetic opioids which are in our drug supply not just in what people think is heroin but in our illicit benzos some THC vapes um, sleeping pills you know that is not going to go away and we need to be ready for it and trekking is a really uh, one of the best you know you know a very effective way of doing that we want to look at enhanced harm reduction centers where people can inject and use their drugs under supervision and support so that they don't overdose um, and again you know there's we believe there's a way that we can do that which is which is legal we want to ensure that all service all people who need our services will get the same high level of service wherever they live in wales that everybody who's involved in service gets a chance to inform and design and be part of that service delivery from you know cradle to grave everybody has a voice in in the services that we provide and that's really really important the best way that we can develop services is to listen to the people who use them to listen to act and to change um to always be open to new things you know we educate ourselves you know you don't stop learning just because we've been in this field for a long time quite the reverse we're always learning and and i think to remain open and for and for us in terms of our services and for policy makers and government to be brave and to be bold in a new world order we can do stuff in wales really quickly and really cleverly and together and we should be doing that and we should be really driving the agenda in those innovative harm reduction responses um yeah you know i, I i'd like to see 
I'd like to see some of those things really happen in in the near future. And um, you know, and I think if we do that, then we can honestly say that we've done as best that we can to minimise harm to people. I think a lot of those things, as well as a few other things that we haven't mentioned today, you know, they're already happening. Yeah. You know, not necessarily yeah. in the UK, but across the world. You know, and I think if we were able to bring all those together yeah. in Wales, I think it would put Wales potentially as a as a as a world leader you know yeah. in terms of like substance use and harm reduction and yeah. and because they are being done yeah i think suggests that they can be done here they can it, be they done just Rob, that yeah. kind of yeah that will, we need, that, we need that will that drive that sort of energy that sort of you know that um yeah you know the enthusiasm really the energy the enthusiasm the drive for innovation the drive to really be at the at the, the pioneering point where we are not just waiting for the evidence to come but creating that evidence as we deliver um you know that's what we should be doing we shouldn't be sitting in our laurels we should be you know we should be evolving and changing and be fit for purpose to to be able to respond to the threats that we inevitably will face with nitazines it may be something else next year but we've got to be we've got to be there we've got to have the we've got to have the, the ability to do do the stuff that we need to do but for now caroline thank you hannah thank you hope you both have a lovely weekend and we will see you soon Bye -bye. thank you if you have been affected by any of the issues discussed in today's podcast please reach out Barrod have a free and confidential live web chat service that is available seven days a week on our website at barrod.com where you can chat to a trained support worker. Alternatively, you can contact Wales's National Drug and Alcohol Helpline DAN 24-7, either by calling 0808 808 2234 or text DAN to 81066.